I started working with him in 2010 in Nigeria. I work as house help. I do everything in the house, take care of the kids. He was a good man. Everything was good. When did he start talking to you about coming to the United States? He never said anything. He just said, go get your passport. You're going to the United States, and that's it. I never knew it was going to be permanent. Blessing Daniel is talking about her former boss, actual Nigerian prince, Eze Matamir. And the court records we went through show that he brought her here on a tourist visa and put her to work at his house in a Houston suburb. She was working there, you know, essentially 24 seven for her waking hours. Instead of paying her wages um, like, like you should normally, he um, told her that he would be sending money to her family in Nigeria. My name is Dokwang Daniel Pham. I am a staff attorney for the Equal Justice Center. We help people who have suffered some sort of issue in the workplace, be it wage theft or employment discrimination, and we uh, help them get justice against the employers that have wronged them. There was no promises here, but there was promises back in Nigeria before coming, like taking care of my child, my daughter, paying her school fees, like, you know, getting me a, a hair salon here. You had to leave your daughter? Yes. I didn't come with her. How old is she? She was eight as of that time. That must have been hard. One of the hardest thing ever. Yes. What did they tell you would happen if you left? I don't know. I want to say that. Labor trafficking is the use of force, fraud, and coercion uh, for the purpose of obtaining someone for modern day slavery, for debt bondage, or um, forced labor. But human trafficking isn't just kidnapping. It, it isn't just abduction. Human trafficking usually is done by someone who has a, a close relationship or kinship to you um, and is taking advantage of that. My name is Samantha Ledesma, and I am with YMCA International, which is a part of YMCA Greater Houston. My name is Elise Grissmeyer. I'm the Associate Legal Director for the Cabrini Center for Immigration Legal Services for Catholic Charities. So we work um, exclusively with foreign national survivors of labor trafficking and sex trafficking. And I think when we see stories about trafficking in the media, they tend to take either the form of smuggling, you know, immigrants found in the back of an 18-wheeler, or they take the shape of sex trafficking for young American girls. And those, both of those things are so narrow in focus that we miss how broad trafficking is. That trick we see is, is typically, come work for me, I'll pay you a minimum wage waitressing job. And then you get here and you find out it's something else. A lot of these labor trafficking cases can be with foreign nationals, with somebody who is undocumented in the U.S. While many victims of trafficking are undocumented, there are those, like Daniels, who come to the U.S. on tourist visas. Then there are those who come here on worker visas. So the H-2A and H-2B program specifically are brought in to fill gaps in employment here in the United States. They can apply for visas to bring people into the country. Those visas, however, are tied to that specific employer. So there's this huge power imbalance between the employer and employees. And if they complain about working conditions or hours or the type of work that they're being forced to do, they know that their employer could have them deported at any moment. So whether it's psychological or physical, if that person feels that they cannot leave that labor situation, that work, um, that turns into labor trafficking. A lot of abuse crops up in that system that could be easily resolved if we gave immigrants more flexibility to work within that same field, but the ability to change employers. The United States allows 88 countries to apply for H-2 visas. Between 2018 and 2020, more than 15,800 people were identified by the human trafficking hotline as labor trafficking victims. Nearly 3,700 were holding an H-2 visa. Again, people with these visas cannot change jobs to escape their situation. In Daniel's case, it took a call to get her out. I was going to church at first. I started to make friends, and when they realized I was making friends, they stopped me from going to church. I never had a phone. They never got me one. They say I had no one to call. When her family friends eventually learned that she was in Houston and working for this Nigerian politician, they basically asked, we want to see you, we want to, we want to spend time with you, and she wasn't able to do that under her employer's orders. Eventually they figured oh, something might be wrong and they essentially called the police. Do you remember the day that the police showed up at your house? 
just like right now. I would never forget that. Were you scared going with the police? At first, yes. What did you think was going to happen? I thought I was going to be deported. The fear in me, like, I had no idea what was going on. They said it was human trafficking, so, and I had no idea I was going through that. So a person who is a victim of either sex trafficking or labor trafficking, which is our expertise, um, can sue their employer uh, and recoup damages related to the mental anguish that they've suffered and the, pay the wages that they should have gotten. So it was the YMCA International working on the immigration half of Ms. Daniel's case that eventually referred her to us to do a civil lawsuit. How was that settled? It settled um, for a decent amount of money. We did try to speak with the prince about this case. His attorney emailed us a statement reading the prince was traumatized by the allegations and he filed a counterclaim for defamation. They both ended up settling and closing their claims against each other. We haven't seen a lot of criminal prosecution on the cases that we've been working on. It's hard to grapple with this definition and understand that labor trafficking is not just a workplace violation, it's also a human rights violation. With the resources that uh, law enforcement has, um, it's still a difficult uh, case to prosecute. Kenneth Magidson, former U.S. attorney in the Southern District of Texas. Is it easier to go after the sex trafficking, because that usually involves multiple women with more clear-cut signs of other crimes being committed, versus the one person who is a domestic servant? The federal resources in law enforcement are always stretched thin because there's so many demands upon what kind of cases they take. Even in the sense of forced labor, they're always going to be looked at in terms of multi-state investigations. In other words, is this something that's being, occur that's being done by a cartel? Is this something that's being done by organized crime? But we have to put the infrastructure in to handle the immigration problem. And right now, we don't have that infrastructure. We just have law enforcement at the border trying to stop people. That infrastructure could come in the form of two paths. Both require bipartisan support at our nation's capital, which is hard to accomplish these days. Remember those visas. The first path would require a change to how employers who sponsor immigrant workers are properly vetted or monitored. It would also give visa holders the opportunity to change jobs if their employer was abusing their position. Nationally, the second path lands on enforcing current laws, and it would require a joint effort from law enforcement, federal agencies, state and city leaders, and grassroots or nonprofit advocates. There's also a huge coalition, which is the Houston uh, Rescue and Restore Coalition, that has over 50 organizations working together to really uh, you know, fix these gaps in services. We have a trafficking victims assistance program through our refugee resettlement program that can do financial assistance and case management and counseling and shelter and food and GED or classes or whatever it is that they might need. We also know that Houston is a model for the response to human trafficking, that we were, had one of the first federally funded task forces to address human trafficking, that our mayor's office has set up a task force as well and it's been used as a model not only nationally but internationally as well. So for whoever is going through what I went through, I wanna say speak to somebody. You can always trust someone out there. Speak. If you have opportunity, make that one phone call, and that's it. There is a lot to discuss here, and we'd like to hear your opinions. Drop a comment below and make sure you hit subscribe to stay up to date with Solutionaries.